Please be seated. Uh, children in the fifth grade on down, you're dismissed to go downstairs. And as you do, just think of that rhetorical question. Who is like the Lord our God? Strong to save, mighty. Hmm. Let's bow before God once again because we are a desperately needy people. Lord, um, yeah, thank you again for the privilege of not only entering into your presence, but being able to join that festal gathering and sing. Not necessarily always because we feel like it, but because our hearts are compelled to do it as we consider who is like the Lord our God. There is none like you. Strong to save. Mighty in battle. Holy Spirit, we ask that you fill this place downstairs, upstairs, across the way with those who are praying, online, those who are joining us. Fill with your presence that we might see God, we're going to need you to do some things for us that we just can't do for ourselves. We're going to need you to open my lips so that I can speak your word. And we're going to need you to open our ears so that we can hear. You need to enable both the speaker and the listener if we're going to gain what you have for us this morning. And so we will pray these things in the power and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. I do want to invite you to open your Bibles with me. We have been in the book of Acts, and we're staying there just a few more weeks because there's some valuable stuff there. And we're in uh, not the book of Acts in the sense of line by line, uh, word by word, but really thematically we want to see the church brought to life and what it goes through in this letter. And so that's why we're in the book of Acts, because we firmly believe that there is so much in there for us today. That they were a church that's born into a struggle. They were born into a society that hated them. They were born into a society that persecuted them. And so we are very much in a similar situation. We are in a society that really uh, doesn't care much for the church's message. And so we're going to look particularly at that this morning, a, a very particular incident that goes on that you would look at it on the face and you would say, wow, that's awesome. They should be rejoicing. Everybody should see this situation and be like, wow, that's awesome. Thank you. It's in Acts chapter 3. And uh, we're going to look right at the beginning. We're actually going to end our time in Acts chapter 4, but we can't jump to Acts 4 and jump to what the church's response was until we see what's going on. So I just want to invite you to Acts chapter 3. If you're using your Bible, it's uh, right after the four Gospels. Um, yeah, but please, hopefully, you'll have the word opened before you. And I want to read just the, the first 10 verses. We're going to kind of go along at... Um, a, a, a fairly quick pace to read through some of the scripture because, you know, nothing sounds like more fun than persecution, <laughs> right? So now, verse 1 of chapter 3, Peter and John were going up to the temple. Why? Because it's what they do. It's the hour of prayer. It's the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried. Uh, just picture this in your mind. So you're, you're on your way to church, and outside the door, there's a guy that some friends of his have been, they carried him, and they laid him down right outside the door. You got this, this image in your mind? Whichever door you came in? They laid him there daily at the gate of the temple. That's called the beautiful gate. It's part of the temple. It's, there's a gate there, and they happen to name it the beautiful gate. And they laid him there to ask uh, alms or you know will you help me so they laid a beggar down a lame beggar and so there they are and so this guy's laying there and he sees Peter and John about to go into the temple and he asks them hey will you help me you got anything you can give me 
And Peter directed his gaze at this guy, and so did John. And they said, hey, look at me. I mean, that would get your attention if they're just walking by, right? And, and they stop and look at the guy who's addressing them, and they stop and look at him, and they say, well, just wait a minute. Look, look at me. Look, look. I, I want to... I Peter directed his gaze at him and said, John, and they said, look at us. And the guy fixed his attention on them. You feel almost like a tension building in the story. He's expecting to receive something from them, and Peter said, I don't have what you think you need. I don't have any silver or gold. I don't have money. I, I'm broke. I could probably join you because I'm that broke. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Whoa. Did you just see this scene unfolding? And there's a crowd of people. This is the day that, you know, this is the time of everybody's walking in here. If you're in the area where you hear this happening, I just imagine now your gaze is fixed. Rise up and walk. And he didn't just stand there and say, hey, get up and walk. No. He says, it, he takes him, he reaches out by the right hand, and he raised him up. So he reaches down and gra grabs the guy. Get up on your feet, I said. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately, the guy's feet and ankles were made strong and leaping up. Leaping up. He stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people, all the people, you notice he made a special effort to bring that to our attention. Everybody was watching. Everybody was watching him, walking and praising God. And they knew, verse 10, they recognized this guy. So people who are already in the temple, already getting ready for prayer, see that guy come through that door, walking and leaping and praising God. And they're like, that looks an awful lot like the guy that was just laying outside, crippled. Obviously crippled to the point of deformity in his legs and now here he comes, busting through the door. What do you do? Whew. Wow. They were filled. What an understatement. It says they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So there's the scene. This is what's going on. It's just, but really, it's just an ordinary, unexpected kind of encounter. It's just an ordinary day, both for the the, all the people involved, Peter and John, it says they're going on the way to the temple for the hour of prayer. It's so routine. It's just an ordinary day for them. What are you doing today? Oh, it's 3 o'clock. Oh, let's go. We've got to get to the prayer time. You know, it's just the way it was. And oh, it's almost 3 o'clock. It's about 2.30. Maybe we should, uh, you know, the friends come and gather the guy and grab his mat that he's probably laying on. Oh, it's, all right, let's go. Just another day. Just another day. Just an Ordinary day, doing what they always do. You see, here's the thing. God can actually use the ordinariness, if you will, of our routines when he desires to do something extraordinary. He can use our ordinary. He can use our routines even if we dare to let him. Peter and John took a risk. There is no doubt about it. It's kind of like sharing your faith at work, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, it's kind of like that. When Ben says to me this morning, I had, I had an opportunity to tell one of my coworkers about Jesus. I said, really? How did that happen? 
Well, we were just sitting there talking before people came to the, where we were, and it just kind of happened. And so just an ordinary day. He didn't, I bet you didn't go there with a sermon in your pocket ready, did you? No? I bet you didn't just say, all right, bring on the next suspecting person. No, he's just going about his day, an ordinary day. And he has an uninspected, unexpected encounter. An unexpected encounter. You know, I can already kind of anticipate your thoughts, formulating your head, what I call your yabuts. It sounds like a Jewish word in the Bible, right? Your yabuts. Yeah, but, yeah, you see? Yeah, but. We, we do that. We, we make all kinds of excuses for ourselves. We there's a ton of yeah buts going on in our minds right now. The first one, of course, is, yeah, but that's Peter and John, right? Yeah, but they're apostles, right? Yeah, but, and, we, and so, yeah, but Ben, was, you know, yeah, but, and we give ourselves all these outs. I do. I, maybe I shouldn't include you in my guilt. Um, but we do. And when we say, you know, they're apostles for crying out loud. I could never do that. If you met Peter, just as you have a conversation with Ben about this, if you meet Peter, at some point, you know, at this point in his life, you're, you're having a conversation just like Ben is having a conversation with his coworker, and eventually it'll come to the conversation with Peter, hey, what do you do? You know, like, what do you do for a living? Because, you know, we're just using the yeah, but he's an apostle thing. So you have that conversation with Peter, and it comes around to the question, hey, hey, what do you do? I bet you he would not, at this point in his life, identified himself as an apostle. I bet he would not have identified himself as an evangelist. I bet he would not have said, oh, I am a healer. No. He probably would have said, well, I was a fisherman. Now I'm um, currently unemployed. And honestly, I'm not sure who I am at this moment. But here he is, just an ordinary day, going to church with a friend and as they walk in the doors there there's this guy just laying there and looking at them as they pass by and notice what he says what he does he actually does something in the sense that he says I can't give you what I don't have so he's honest I mean he's I can't but I I can give you I can't give you what you think you need I just can't. And it wasn't, he wasn't trying to make excuses. I just can't give you what you think you need, but I can give you what you don't think you need. I can give you what you don't think you need. Because the only thing I have that's of any value in my life, I'm willing to give to you. As a matter of fact, I'm willing to give you the most valuable thing in my life. I'm willing to give you Jesus. In the name of Jesus, would you stand? I can't give you what you think you need, but I can give you what you don't think you need, if that makes any sense. So this unexpected encounter then leads into yet really another unexpected opportunity. So look at me in verse, verse, verse 3, 11. And so this guy is clinging now to Peter and John, it says, and all the people utterly astounded, and they ran together. I love the imagery that he's, he says, this guy, like Peter and John are just kind of sauntering, they're on their way to church, the prayer meeting, and like you, on August, you know, this coming Tuesday, you're probably, if you'll come, you'll probably lollygag in there. So Peter and John are kind of just moseying on in there, but this guy's leaping and running, it says, and he's probably got them both by the coattails, and he's like, come on, let's go. We're going to go praise the Lord. 
They ran together to them. Into the, so this whole group of people starts running. What in the world? And Peter saw it. An unexpected encounter is going to lead to an unexpected opportunity. And Peter saw it, verse 12. And he addressed the people. He didn't create this opportunity. He didn't come that day with a sermon in his pocket. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you, are you, do you think I did that? You stare at us as though by somehow by our own power or godliness, we made this guy walk? No. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus. No, you, you, you know who I'm talking about because you delivered him over and denied in the presence of Pilate. And he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous Jesus and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life who God raised from the dead. He's not dead anymore. And we are witnesses of this. And his name, and by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this perfect health in the presence of you all. Peter saw that opportunity and he, and he just stepped in. You know, he, he said, okay, I got a crowd here. And he spoke. He wasn't looking, he didn't go there looking for an audience. You're catching my thing here. You know, he wasn't going there looking for an audience. He, he didn't have this sermon all prepared. He didn't think himself an apostle probably. He didn't see himself as an evangelist at this point. He certainly wouldn't have considered himself a healer. He just stepped into an opportunity that presented itself. Really, that's my point. He stepped into an opportunity that presented itself. God did this and said, here you go, Peter. The unexpected opportunity also leads to unexpected results. Look at me. Now we're going to go into chapter 4. In verse 4, in many of those who had heard, chapter 4, verse 4, many of those who had heard the word, what did they do? They believed. And the number of men came to about 5,000, so hundreds, if not maybe a couple thousand people as a result of this event say yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus. An unexpected opportunity leading to an unexpected results, which, as you guessed it, leads to also unexpected consequences. Read the first three verses of chapter 4. So they're speaking to the people. The priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And they said, oh man, you guys are so great. Thank you so much for healing this guy and telling everybody about Jesus. You guys are awesome. No. Verse 2, greatly annoyed. Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus, the resurrection from, from the dead. Proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. That's their guilt. That's their crime. And they arrested them and put them in jail until the next day for it was already evening. So they want to question them, but it's too late to do that. We don't want to miss dinner. So, hey, just throw them in jail for the night because they're so greatly annoyed. They are not impressed at all. A man is healed, visibly altered. Hundreds, if not thousands, have expressed faith in God. That's, you know, when we talk about this, the, the, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, that's their deal. That's they, that they want people to express faith in God. And here we have hundreds, if not thousands, expressing faith in God through Jesus. Oh, oh, time out. You see, God is great. As long as we can picture him any way we want, we can 
imagine a God any way we want. We can create a God in any form we want and call it God. But they are doing this in the name of Jesus. That's the problem. Hundreds of people start going to church, turning their lives from sin, probably becoming far better citizens. You would think, wow, what a win for any community, right? If all of a sudden all the people in Geneseo or the town you live in become a Christian and, and start having radically altered lives and start going to church, that somehow the community would see that as bad. But they would. Those who would remain would see that. Why? What's up with that? What's the deal? I mean, we think about the, the, we've been trying to step into some opportunities here, Christ Community Church, trying to really engage the community well and love our community. You know, so we're partnering with the school and, and we're giving them gift cards and we're, we're partnering with the, the sheriff's department and we're partnering with the police department and we're, you know, I've had opportunities to partner with the fire department and we're doing all of these things and, and I'm, I think they like that. They've, I know they do. They've told me they do. They've expressed how wonderful it is that we're doing these things and they're really thankful for our charity. I'm not so sure they would embrace our message any more than Peter's message was embraced. But we're not going to look at that antagonistically, and we're not going to point fingers, and, and we're not going to say, well, then what are we doing that for? No, we, we, what we do is we, we're honest about it, and we recognize the challenge that's before us. And what is that challenge just before us as a body? What's the challenge just before each of us individually when we do go about our lives trying to be nice in hopes that, right? We do that. We say, oh, just love because it's that message of love that will make somebody ask someday. Well, that's our challenge. Our challenge is how are we going to continue to do that? How are we going to continue to minister in the name of Jesus and actually incorporate the name of Jesus into it. That's what we're working to, towards. And that's what, you know, we have hope. That's our goal, our hope. Maybe not a goal, but a hope. That we can actually incorporate the name of Jesus into what we're doing. So when we're wherever and we feel that pressure to do something nice, something loving, Something kind. You know, don't not do it. Always step into it. But then also be seeking, Jesus, is there a way that I can actually speak your name here? And, and I want it to be organic. I don't want it to be fabricated in such a way that it's awkward for them and me. But yeah, so Jesus, help me to do that. Help us as a church as we're trying to reach into these different spheres to do that. It's the powers that be ask this name. If you go to verse 7 of chapter 4, the powers that be ask an interesting question. By what power and by what name? What makes you tick? Where are you getting this stuff from? What a strange second question. The first one kind of makes sense. You know, really, they're asking, how did you do this? What in the world happened? Where'd the, what kind of power is that? Is that like magic? Is it, do you have a healing thing going on? But the second question, by what name do you do this? And it wasn't an earnest inquiry motivated by interest. They're looking, I imagine that the word is already got out. There are these people out here, and they're speaking in the name of Jesus. And so these people who saw this run in like little tattletales to the priests and say, they're, they're teaching in the name of Jesus. And so they're, like, they're putting them on the spot. Um, whose, whose name did you do this in? 
And Peter and John are like, really? Is this actually happening? Verse 8 and 9, are, is this, are we actually being arrested for healing a crippled guy? Well, not, not really. It's, it's what else you did. You, you, can, you can go to the hospital, heal all the crippled people, but don't do it in the name of Jesus. Don't do it in the name of Jesus. That's intolerable. That's intolerable. That's the culture they were living in. Do all the good you want. But don't do it in the name of Jesus. I think it sounds awfully familiar to our day. You can talk about God. Just let me make up in my mind who God is. If maybe, I don't know, are you here this morning? And you've kind of made a comfortable image of God that fits your perspective. Then you've created an image of God that makes he's more manageable. I like to think of God like. But not this Jesus guy because no. Let's look at verse 10. As they respond, the, the Peter and John respond to this. Let it be known to all of you in verse 10 and all the people of Israel that it's, let me be clear, where he could have backpedaled, where he could have tried to soften the blow a little bit, where he could have tried to find a way to be accepted by this crowd, he says, let me be clear. It's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you well. This Jesus is the stone that you reject. He's the cornerstone, actually, the most important one. Where, and there's salvation by no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Wow, take that message to the streets. Go have that conversation. You might not even believe that fully and totally in your hearts. You might actually believe that there are multiple paths to God. And so when Jesus says, no, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me, and Peter reiterates it here that there is salvation in no one else for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You got to grapple with that. We got to grapple with this foundational truth. We got to grapple with the reality that that people who say they love God but don't know Jesus are not Christians. Are not following God. Because he has said this. And it's the tipping point for our culture. The exclusivity of our claim is something that we have to be able to deal with if we're ever going to have a witness. And it's not easy. I'm not saying this as though, you know, we should, you know, like, braggadociously beat people up with this claim. But we should engage people with the claims of Christ. And trust the Holy Spirit to do just as I prayed at the beginning. Enable both the speaker and the listener. Now when they saw the boldness, verse 13, this is an amazing verse. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common people, they were rather astonished because they had recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, that recognition doesn't change their opinion of Jesus. We'd like to read that like it was a Disney movie kind of thing. But it doesn't. It doesn't change their opinion of Jesus and it doesn't change their stance on the issue at hand. But they also couldn't deny it. That's the point that's being made here by Luke, the author of this letter. 
It was undeniable even to those. They couldn't deny that there was something special about these people. It's kind of a backhanded, unintended compliment. You know, you're, you're really nobody special. You're really not credentialed. You, there's no, you know, you're really not that smart. That's what they're saying. Like, is that a compliment? But your closeness to Jesus Christ is so profound. It's palpable when you're here. And they couldn't deny it. There's the guy, says verse verse 14. The guy's standing right there beside him. You know, probably not standing still. As a, my, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's afraid he's going to come back. And he doesn't, you know, so he's probably still a little bit leaping. Standing right beside Peter and John. And it says in verse 16, and they couldn't say anything. The evidence was so undeniable. One act. Here's the thing. That's what I want you to just consciously think about this morning. If I could just grab your attention for just a minute. Listen, please. One act done to one person in a seemingly chance encounter one act done to one person in a seemingly chance encounter. It wasn't grand at the moment. I mean, here it is recorded in all history, but I just have three quick thoughts that I think they could be considered applications, I suppose, but really I just want us to consider these things. I wonder if we often miss the possibilities of a moment to be in the present because we're too stinking busy. Oh. I wonder if I, I miss so many possibilities in the present because I can't be in the present because my calendar won't let me. I think that I wonder, really, if the fear, well, let me be honest, it's not a fear, or it's not a I think, or it's not a I wonder, it's, I'm pretty much convinced that the fear of perception, you know, what will they think of me? What will those people think of me? Stops me from possibilities as well. It does. Peter and John, without a doubt, put themselves out there. They took a risk when it was presented. I don't think they went there looking for that necessarily. But when it was presented to them, they had a crowd of people around them, and it's all of a sudden it got really strangely quiet. And all they saw was that. And I wonder if, well, again, maybe I shouldn't word it like a, it's probably true, that the fear of persecution, the idea that we could actually be attacked or have pushback, often stops us, really, from stepping into the moment. I mean, just let's be honest about it. We're, we're afraid of what it might cost us. It doesn't make us bad people. It doesn't deny our faith. We're not, you know, Peter denying our faith, but that's, let's be honest that we, we do have that fear. I mean, for the most part, we seem to be able to get by um, fairly undetected as Christians. And we almost make that a, a goal, an aim. To, I want to be able to get by undetected. Uh, Peter and John lived in a pretty, obviously we were seeing a hostile environment to people of faith in Jesus. They did. They, they probably weren't headed to the prayer meeting that day with thoughts of, hey, how can we draw attention to ourselves? How can we live boldly? Let's, let's do something courageous today and draw the attention of those who seek to persecute us. But they didn't run from it either. We're living in a day very similar to theirs where being a closet Christian is really 
appealing. Like hiding a little bit can seem pretty attractive, right? I mean, who wants to jump out and do that? So when you look out across the landscape of our cultural upheaval, uh, just look at the headlines. Does it? Are you a little scared? I mean, are you a little, like, is there some angst in your hearts as you look out and you read the headlines and you see and you encounter? Maybe we're just scared of what it could cost us. Um, when you look and see all that is, was once called good and right and God-honoring, is now being called wrong. And we watch as, as really everything we once knew to be wrong is celebrated. And you get a little angst in our hearts. We get frightened and we want to hide. We want to be closet Christians. Here's, here's why I don't think we should be frightened. Here's why I don't think we should be scared or alarmed. Actually, I think there's two reasons. The first one is this. If you're reading the book, the Bible, of all people, we should know that we were told in advance this is how it's going to be. You are living amongst a kingdom of darkness. It's not going to get better and better and better until we all reach this ethereal, wonderful, happy place. It's going to get worse and worse. And we were told that. It's part of God's plan. Well, it doesn't make it easier. I'm not trying to make it go away or make it sound like, oh, we should rejoice in this. But we should rejoice in the fact that when we look out, God isn't surprised. It's though somehow God from on high is looking down and saying, wow, I never saw COVID coming. Ah, oh, I never considered that there would be an uprising of that which would be called good, which was, I don't, Jesus, what do you think we should do about this? That's not God. Secondly, the promises of God is that his name will be glorified in all the earth. His plan, listen friends, cannot be thwarted. What's that scripture say that the gates of hell itself, much less any nation or any political ideology, will not prevail against his church? So consider this. Think about this for just a moment. As you can go to Rome, the, the, the country, the city of Rome today, and you can go view some of the greatest spectacles on earth. You can go see the great Roman Colosseum, and you can pay... 20 bucks-ish to stand in the ruins. Maybe you're not catching the, the weight of that. You can go and pay 20 bucks and you'll be standing in the remains and looking at ruins. Rome, are you kidding me? They conquered the whole world and they ruled for 1,500 years. They made the Assyrians in Babylon look small and weak. In Egypt, pff, they laughed. They took over the whole world. They made it their mission for literally thousands, hundreds of years to eradicate the church of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. They made it their goal to annihilate followers of Jesus. Yet today, if you pay 20 bucks you can go stand in the ruins of that Rome. But guess what? <laughs> guess what? The church of Jesus Christ still stands. The church of Jesus Christ still stands. And every day, all across the world, people are surrendering their lives to Jesus. Isn't this true, Jim? People are giving their lives to Jesus all over the world today, aren't they? How many million alone on the website that you work with search for Jesus? 17.1 million. Where are they coming from by and large? Fifty to sixty different countries. Anybody coming from Russia? Um, 
Okay. <laughs> All over the world. All right. Well, I'm going to cut you off. Because you can just keep reading. I mean, there's so many different places, right? All over the world, people are giving their lives to Jesus. I just read this week. Now, you'd expect Iran. Wow, that's a, a tough regime. But yet, it's one of the fastest growing churches in the world currently. Not the biggest, but it's one, per capita, it's one of the fastest growing. That's really encouraging news. All across the world, people are surrendering their lives to Jesus. Countries where it costs a lot to identify as a Christ follower. Throughout history, the world has always been trying to destroy Christians like you and me and churches like ours. Listen to Hebrews chapter 11. Suffering, mockings, and floggings, and chains, and prison, stoned, sawn in two, killed with a sword, <clears throat> destitute, afflicted, mistreated, wandering about in deserts and mountains, dens and caves, burned at the stake, used as torches to light gardens. Yet, be encouraged. Be filled with courage because the church still stands. It doesn't cower. It doesn't hide. It isn't scared. It's not shrinking back. No, throughout church history, if we go back to Hebrews 11, it continues, they have conquered kingdoms. They've enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong by weakness, became mighty in war, and they put foreign armies like Rome to flight. How can this be? How? Well, first and foremost, because they, just like you and I, they walk by faith and not by sight. That's what they do. They walk by faith. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says. They walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. It's throwing aside every weight and sin and is running with endurance, looking at Jesus. That's what faith is. Faith says, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. Secondly, not only do we walk by faith, but we remember we have life. We have resurrection life, right? John 11, when Jesus is interacting with Mary and Martha at the tomb of a dead guy, and they're like, Jesus, if you'd have been here sooner, he wouldn't have died. And he says, Mary, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live. And what he's saying there isn't you will get resurrection life. He's saying, I am the resurrection life, and you have resurrected life. I am that life. The thief only comes to kill, steal, and destroy, he told them earlier. But I have come, what? That you may have life, John 10.10, 10, and have it abundantly. Resurrection life is what we have now, and that's how we're able to stand. Thirdly, because we rest in the truth, not only do we have resurrection life, we have eternal life. Thirdly, we have eternal life. We live in the present, in the light of eternal. That's what we've been seeing throughout this entire thing. Blessed be, 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Two, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, you are being guarded by God's power for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last day. We have eternal life. And last, because all this reminds us, it all reminds us that this earth, therefore, is not our home. We were made for so much more than this. We were made for so much greater. That we are all foreigners and strangers, it says in the Bible. He always refers to us as aliens living in the hope of a better land. Living in the hope of a better land. We look forward to the city whose foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That's what we look forward to. What if we started each day? Let me just end with this question. What if we just started each day by adding this prayer as we walk out the door? Anytime we walk out the door or anytime we walk into a door. Not, yeah. 
just add this. Lord Jesus, help me to see the possibilities and act in faith. That's it. It's a simple prayer. <coughs> Where it gets difficult is when we add this part. Even if it messes with my calendar, even if it messes with my calendar, even if I get looked at with weird looks, but help me to see the possibilities and act in faith. We do that together, not because of, you know, we're trying to build some dynasty. Let's just do it because let's live for the glory of Christ. One faith-filled witness at a time, one person at a time. Let's walk by faith and leave the results and the consequences to God that we might live for the glory of God. That's it. That's all I'm asking us, myself included. Let's pray. God, we do bow before you and thank you for your kindness. So good to us, God, that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see Jesus and say, he's not just enough. He's beyond what I could have expected him to be. His grace is greater 